the rationalization on the part of the administration. I, I think deep down that the only thing driving this is the impetus to close Guantanamo Bay and fulfill a campaign pledge. That's one of my old colleagues, the chairman of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, Ed Royce, discussing the president's excessive number of prison transfers out of Guantanamo Bay. This as the Senate debates freezing those transfers and keeping the prison open indefinitely. It's a good place to bring in our panel. Joining us from Big Sky Country, Skyping in from Montana, retired U.S. Army Major General Paul Vallely. Also joining us as he Skypes in from Orlando, Middle East expert Michael Pregent. Michael was the former advisor to the Peshmerga forces in Mosul and to the Iraqi security forces. To you both gentlemen, we welcome you, you. to Newsmax Prime. Now, our president keeps claiming Gitmo uh, by keeping it open, we weaken our national security. Paul, do you agree with that assessment? Yes, uh, I, you know, I know Ed Royce uh, well, and I think he's right on. This is absolutely a move to uh, downgrade uh, the population at Gitmo as, fa as fast as he can. There's no doubt about that, and it's a real tragedy because we need that place open, and uh, we actually need the trials to go on down there. I don't know why they're delaying so much to try these people and put them away or do whatever. What is your take on it, Michael? Well, it's been open this whole time. He pledged to close it as soon as he took office within 100 days and then quickly realized the value of actually being able to take these high-value detainees to a place where we're actually able to treat them as, as combatants as opposed to uh, have them lawyer up and defend themselves with our Constitution. Uh, let me switch topics now. Let's go to ISIS and the Taliban. According to reports, the Taliban faces an insurgent threat from ISIS as ISIS steadily advances into Afghanistan. Paul, how big a threat and a fight might we see between ISIS and the Taliban? I really don't buy that scenario. I think uh, they'll merge over there. Uh, the Taliban realizes that the ISIS forces has the money and the assets to uh, prosecute forward uh, the caliphate. And so I think they'll team up just like ISIS has done in uh, Africa and uh, throughout the Middle East. So uh, I think the scenario will be uh, they're, they're teaming up and it may be just propaganda that there's a conflict there. What about it, Michael? ISIS and the Taliban part of a grand uh, Islamo-fascist alliance? Well, I, I'm seeing uh, fissures. I, I, lo I love to exploit the fissures of terrorist organizations. And ISIS moving into Afghanistan against a very proud Afghan Taliban. I, I hate to say that, but there's a, there's a primacy issue with the Taliban. They don't want to pledge a, a allegiance or buy-out to ISIS. Um, they're happy to work together against a common enemy, but they're not happy to be subjugated to ISIS. And you're seeing some of that pushback in uh, Farah province as well as Jalalabad as ISIS tries to establish a foothold. Well, let, let me follow up with you on that, Michael. Is it something that we can exploit? It's definitely something we can exploit because when, when foreign fighters come into Afghanistan and start telling the Taliban what to do, uh, you can exploit that. I, I'm not saying we work with the Taliban to kill ISIS, but you can exploit the fissures there and, and you will get some informants to tell us that there is a, an ISIS base here. Uh, in the Farah province, the Taliban basically overran one of these training camps that ISIS was establishing, <clears throat> ended up having a firefight, chased them out of there, and took about 55 guys prisoners, and then kicked the rest out of the country. So there's places where we can exploit those fissures. We just want to make sure we don't make the Taliban look like uh, the good guy now either. We have to remember what they've been all about. Yeah, a whole lot of bad guys in this thing. And Paul, let's go to an area of special interest to you, and that's what's been happening in Syria. There are new accusations against Assad and his regime. According to Human Rights Watch, the Syrian government used toxic chemicals during a recent surge in attacks on rebel-held forces in northern Syria. What does this new accusation mean for the Syrian government and for our own commander-in-chief as uh, we take a look at what may be next there? Well, from what I've been able to gather, uh, J.D., uh, Assad is on life support right now, basically uh, containing that area of uh, Damascus and uh, up to the northwest, which is the Alawite region. But we just got a report in that uh, General Soleimani from the Iranian Revolutionary Guard has proposed, and they have uh, tentatively approved a movement of some 15,000 
Iranian Revolutionary Guard by air into Damascus to reinforce Assad and Hezbollah uh, against not only uh, the opposition forces, but against ISIS. Uh, so that's the scenario that we may see develop here in the next week. Uh, Michael, about 20 seconds for your take on what's going on in Syria. Well, that's a great point by the general. The Quds Force and Soleimani and Khomeini are spending money they don't have, and they're banking on sanctions relief because of the Iran deal. The RGC can't, can't afford to send 15,000 guys to Syria unless they're being assured that sanctions will be lifted and sequestration, in effect, would, would end for, for the Quds Force. All right, we will have to leave it there. Gentlemen, you obviously know whereof you speak. Michael Pregent in Orlando, General Paul Vallely in Montana. Gentlemen, to you both, our thanks, and we're coming back.